What's up, everyone? Welcome back to part three of my series in creating a sci-fi weapon for VR games. In the last episode, we worked on creating the high poly model, where we focused on creating each component and then added some specific details and all kinds of bumps and bruises in ZBrush. We also talked about the software that's involved in the game asset pipeline, all the different programs that you can use and the ones that I'll specifically be using in this series. We are so close to the texturing part of the process, I'm so excited, but there's one more step that we gotta do and it's probably one of the most important parts in the entire pipeline. And that is laying out the UVs and doing our baking. Now, I know this part of the process probably isn't the most exciting. It does get a bad rap, probably because it's really more technical and perhaps not the most artistic and methodical, but in the end, it's more like solving a puzzle and it can be kind of fun and, dare I say it, and maybe even a little bit- Adventurous, exciting. I was gonna say meditative. <laughs> She's stunned. Mainly because there's just a bunch of specific rules to follow when it comes out to laying UVs and quick problem solving tips and tricks when you have problems baking mesh maps. In addition to that, we also have to completely recreate our model in a low poly version. Once we create that low poly version, we can then lay out the UVs of that version of the mesh and then bake our mesh maps onto it. By the way, I just put out a video on doing some material exploration in Substance Designer. So I'm looking at ahead of time, kind of do some research on what kind of materials I want to make for this project. And while I was doing that, I wanted to make a tutorial on creating two painted metal textures. So I just put out this video here. We make some damaged metal. Check it out on YouTube. I'll put it up here and I will also put it in the, and I'll also put it in the description down below. So with every portfolio piece that I make, I have these goals that I set for myself to push the boundaries of what I know how to do so I can expand my skill set and get better as a digital artist. So for this particular step, when it comes to creating a low poly version and laying out the UVs and baking mesh maps, I've kind of laid out a couple goals. One of those goals is to figure out what kind of detail I can bake into a mesh map before it turns into something that looks really flat and fake and 3D like. I want to determine if I can put something into the normal map and bake that as a bump or if I really do need to make it actual geometry. So I'm going to be varying the amounts of detail in terms of geometry in my low poly to see what turned out good, what didn't, and some parts I'm just going to make simple quads, other parts I'm really going to subdivide. It's going to be neat to see what happens. So why remake the mesh in a low poly version of it? Why do the whole thing all over again? Well, like we talked about in the previous videos, video games is as much about optimization as it is about creating really realistic and beautiful artwork. Especially when it comes to VR, we really, if we want to put like a thousand things on the screen, they're all doing something different and they all have beautiful effects and they all have you know, lighting and reflection and roughness and bump and all this. To make it a lot easier on the system, we don't want to limit ourselves by creating these massively dense polygonal assets. We want to make things nice and smooth and simple and have as little geometry as possible. So to do that, we can create these low poly versions and then fake it by baking in all the information into these maps that get projected onto this mesh. All right, so here's the plan. I'm going to go through each high poly component and determine if it needs a low poly counterpart. I'm going to ask, you know, does it have good topology? Is it made out of quads? Is the mesh way too dense? You know, I'm thinking about quads because I want to be able to easily lay out the UVs by making cuts. I know that eventually I'm going to have to triangulate this mesh to get it to work really well with game engines. Then if it is too dense, can I easily remesh it using something like ZBrush where I can either do Dynameshing or I could do Z Remesher or try and decimate it using the Decimation Master again. Although Decimation Master in ZBrush really chooses to favor a low poly count over really nice topology. So it's sort of questionable what you're gonna get if you use it. Otherwise, all I have to do is create a cube and start extruding polys and just matching it up. 
with the high poly version. The important part here is labeling and organization. I need to make sure that the components match up in the low and the high poly version. If there's a high poly version of this deflector component that I made, then there has to be a low poly to match it up. It needs to match up exactly so that when we start baking things, things transfer over perfectly. So here we are in Cinema 4D, and this is the high poly version that we made in the last video. So I'm taking a look at my components here, and I'm looking at this one in particular, and this is the bottom underscore high. Now, if you notice here, I've already taken the liberty to put this suffix after each of my meshes that I have, each of the components in this model. So you can see I have deflector boxes underscore high. And so I wanna make sure that I keep this convention underscore high after all of these in the naming, this is that naming convention. And then for the low, I'm gonna put the same name in the front, but then put underscore low. So let's take a look at the vertices. I'm gonna hit NB, and you can see that the topology is absolutely ridiculous. And that's because the Decimation Master in ZBrush does a really good job of, you know, flattening out these areas, but it's really uneven topology and it's kept the topology really high where all this micro detail is around the corners. So it's looking like what I'm gonna have to do is box model this shape in a very simple manner by extruding some polys. So let's do that right now. I'm just gonna get a cube and I'm gonna put this under the component that I'm making. And what's nice about this is now I can then do something like resetting the position scale and rotation so that it matches right up and I can just scale this down. Now it's looking like the axis is a bit off. So what I'm gonna do is, and this is different for every piece of software, but if you happen to be using Cinema 4D, you can follow this. Um, I'm just gonna go and I'm pressing Shift C to get to this command center. This is one of my favorite parts about Cinema 4D is that if you know what the command is called, then you can just type it in here. So I know that the command is called axis center, which brings up this dialog box. And I wanna move the axis right to the middle of this geometry. So I'm gonna hit execute. And now you can see that axis jumped here. So now, if I go to this cube, reset PSR, it jumps straight to the middle, making my life much, much easier. And so first up, I'm just gonna match up this box a little bit, and then I'm gonna start making some cuts and extruding some polys. So I've got the basic mesh matched up and it's really useful to do this in an orthographic side view so that you know things match up perfectly. So now I'm just gonna create some cuts to make this inlet here. So KL is the shortcut for loop cut. So I'm just gonna make one here and here. I know they're not matching up right now, but I've got an approximation. And then what I can do is just select these points and then move these over. zoom in to make sure I'm getting it just right. Got to make sure these match up pretty perfectly and encapsulate this rounded corner. Same thing with this side. And now I'm just going to move these over a little bit so that the line is perfectly parallel with this. and then create another loop here and adjust these points. So this one I think is okay. Oh, almost. Let's just dial it in a little more. And I'll do the same thing over here. And now what I can do is I can go back into my perspective view and start deleting the extra polygons. So I'm going to get into polygon mode, delete. Let's also get rid of these sides. And now I can bridge these together. Let's hide. Actually, let's just solo this mesh. So it's the only one that I see right now. Great. I'm gonna go to the bridge tool and just connect these pieces. And now this is a low poly version of that component that will get that extra detail, including the rounded edges here and make it look a lot more high quality. But this is all we have compared to what we had before, which was this guy. 
And so now I'm gonna be pretty much doing that for the rest of this piece and really determine if I need to completely remake it or if something like this simple shape could suffice. And again, one of my goals was to figure out, you know, is this too high poly? Is it not? Was that too low poly? And we're just kind of experimenting here. Okay, so I've gone through and this is my low poly mesh. Now I know it doesn't look very low poly, it has varying degrees of resolution. So you can see we have that piece we made here, which is a lot simpler, but then we also have some more complex pieces like this back piece here, which has a lot of smooth subdivided topology. And so I'm gonna be determining, you know, do I get those rounded edges just by making something simple like this and baking it into normals? Or do I really need more geometry like I have with this piece here? If you look at the topology like on something like this, this was something that I took into ZBrush and just subdivided a couple times and remeshed it. And so I get some nice clean topology like this. And I wanna see if that was a convenient way to do something or if it really messes up how things bake further in the future. At quick glance, this is what the low poly looks like. It still looks pretty good, but you see we don't have any of those marks around the front. And even up here, we don't have anything in this deflector piece. Oh, and you can see that I've kept with my naming convention. I've put underscore low after each component. Every component has a matching high component and they're all in the same exact place that they should be. And this will be extremely useful when we want to quickly match up these pieces to create baking groups in Marmoset. Now it's time to unwrap the UVs. All right, let's talk a little bit about UVs. Oh, UVs. So if you don't know what UVs are, imagine that you took a piece of geometry and you unwrapped it or flattened it out like it was a piece of origami or a cereal box that you needed to fold away and toss. Now, once you've unwrapped it and you've got this either one piece or a couple of pieces that you've ripped apart, you need to fit it into a complete square. This is called a zero to one UV tile. What's nice is that all of these pieces do not need to be touching. However, if you do, it prevents what's called seam lines. Now, if you do your UVs correctly, your texture artists are going to love you. And if you're the texture artist, then you are going to love you. And that's for many reasons. In Substance Painter, we are going to be painting directly onto the 3D mesh, which is one of the reasons why texturing is so much fun and it's such an incredible piece of software. But sometimes you're gonna have to go into the 2D flat view with all of your UV pieces or shells as they were, and you're gonna have to paint on them. That's usually when you wanna do something that's usually on a cylindrical surface surface or you just want it all flat so you can get like some nice texture detail. It's just easier to think about it when you're looking at it on a flat plane. Now if you do the UVs correctly and nicely, you can have all these particular pieces aligned and grouped together. So you can align them so maybe there's a bunch of vertical pieces all next to each other or you have components that are similar materials or part of the same portion of the mesh together in one spot on that zero to one square. Another important part of this process is about something called texel density. You need to make sure that when you apply a texture to the mesh, that each piece is going to scale or keep that resolution of that texture the same across the entire object. And I know that a lot of people can get away with not doing this correctly if there's a part of the mesh that's never really gonna be visible, but really for best practices, it's best to keep it all the same texel density. Now for cinema or for film or pre-rendered assets, you can use something called UDIM tiles. And that's where you can put multiple materials from the same mesh into more than just one tile. Instead of zero to one, you now have one to two or something like that. And we're not really gonna dive into UDIMs in this particular piece, but they are so useful, especially because Substance Painter now supports UDIMs. There is so much to talk about when it comes to UVs, so you can definitely bet that I'll be making future videos about this because it's just as an important part of texturing as actually painting in the textures or creating the materials. So I'm gonna take you now into the program that I'm using to unwrap my UVs. And instead of doing it right in something like Maya or Cinema 4D, I have a program that's amazing. It makes things so easy and so, well, simple to understand in my brain. And maybe it does for you too. And it's called Rhizome UV. So let's head into Rhizome UV now and unwrap this object. And I can show you a little bit about what I'm talking about and what I'm thinking about when I'm creating UVs so that when I'm further along in the process and I'm texturing, I'm going to think past me. Okay, so we're in Rhizom UV now, and this is what you get. You get two viewports here. One's the 3D, and one is the 2D. You can 
Alt left click to look around and see your mesh. Zoom in and out just like you would in Maya by right clicking and holding Alt and middle mouse buttoning to pan. And then you have your UVs laid out here. Now this is the zero to one tile that I was telling you about. We have this square here and we need to now unwrap this object so that it's all of its pieces are flat and fit inside this square. Now I want to show you one of the most amazing features that Ryzen UV has. And if you need to do something really quick and you don't need to care too much about the UV layout, you can click this button here. So I'm going to click this. This is going to unwrap automatically this whole object using what's called a box algorithm and pack it into this square. So watch this one click and it's done. So you can now see that all of these pieces have been unwrapped and flattened and been packed into this zero to one space automatically. And what's incredible is that took two seconds. And while this process isn't going to take too long, if you really need to get something done quickly and you don't really need to care about how things are connected or oriented, it's done. And I can show you what it's done here. So if I apply a quick texture, let me just apply this checkerboard. You can see that each of these pieces have the same, what I was calling texel density in that this square is the same size as this square. And if you just apply a texture across the board, across the whole object, you're good to go. But we do have some interesting seam lines. So you can see here, here's one piece, here's another piece, but when they connect, they don't match up. So when you're doing your UVs, you need to think about how you're going to be looking at this object. And I know for me, as the player in VR, and this is really mainly a right-handed weapon, but you can do it left-handed as well. I'm going to be holding this in my right hand, and so I'm mainly going to see this. So I do not want to see a seam line right here all the time. I'd rather have a seam line maybe in the middle of this object down here and across under here than right here where I'm going to see it. So you got to keep those things in mind as you do this. But if you need something quick and dirty and you don't need to worry about seam lines and you use something like camera projection or triplanar projection, which we'll talk about in the texturing part of this process, then you can just quickly press that button and you're good to go. You hit save, it saves it into the OBJ file that we have and you're done. So unfortunately though, I'm going to have to undo this and we are now back to square one. But definitely one of the best things about Ryzen UV is that you can quickly get this done. It's a UV dedicated program just for this particular task about what we're about to do. So like I broke down the high poly and low poly into components, I'm going to do the same thing when it comes to UVs. So one of the nice things that I can do is I can hover over an object here and hit I. Now this isolates that object in the viewport for me. And so now I can do whatever I'd like. And so the main thing that you're going to be doing in Ryzen UV is you're going to be making cuts and then you're going to unwrap things here. So let me figure out where I want to put a cut. I'd rather not have it on the side here. So I think I might do it underneath. And so what I'm going to do, this is quite a dense mesh. So you can see why breaking this down in the low poly is a, a better idea. But what I'm going to do now is I'm going to select, oh, that's selecting the whole thing. I'm going to select this vertex. And if I hold shift, it's going to find the shortest path here. And I can just do that or I could double click and it'll find me a loop. So I know that I'm definitely going to do a loop here and what I need to do is hit C and that makes a cut. And now if I hit U, it's going to flatten this thing out and you can see I get a checkerboard here because now I've applied this, this checkerboard pattern. But you can see now I've unwrapped that and what I can do is I can then press the H key to hide it. So I'm going to do the same thing now, but let's unwrap this piece underneath. So I'm just going to zoom out. You can use the scroll wheel to zoom out as well. Just want a straight line down the whole thing, clicking in, zooming in, and we'll go to about, well, here's good. I'm going to hit C to make a cut. I'm also going to double click and make a loop selection back here. So I get the back part as well. C. It's funny. That looks like it's done it on a diagonal, but we can fix that in a second. Now I can unwrap this as well and you can see what it's done here. Now it's it's made this whole thing one flat piece and what I can do is hit P to pack. And now all of these pieces are evenly distributed. And so now that's one component done. And it's that easy. You just make some cuts, figure out where you want your seams to be. 
Now I'm not too worried about having a seam here, but what you will notice is the texel density is off. So what I would do is I would probably run the packing algorithm and this does something really crazy, but now you can see everything here, it matches. So I'm gonna undo that for now. And now let's tackle our next piece. So maybe what I'm gonna do is this big piece here. So I'm gonna isolate that. I'm gonna put another seam along the bottom. So maybe what I'll do is I'll make a cut this way. See, unwrap. I'm gonna hide that for now. See if I can quickly get a nice loop here. Great, unwrap that. And now let's unwrap this piece. And I'll just pack it. See what it looks like. Great. Here's a good example of unwrapping. So these are the rings in the ray part of the weapon. And so I've just made a cut that goes along the inside of this ring and then around down here. And if I go ahead and hit C to cut, and then I'm gonna isolate with I, U to unwrap, and here's what we get. Now I've made a couple mistakes, but I kind of did it on purpose because I wanted to show you how you could fix them just in case. So what I can do is I can select these two points and hit W to weld. And that's gonna bring them together. Same thing with these two points, W, weld. And then what I can do is hit U to unwrap again. And now this is looking a bit strange. So what I'm gonna do is select this island. So I'm just gonna go back to island selection and I can align this completely horizontally or I can rotate it, holding spacebar, right clicking and snap it this way and then hit vertical like that. So another thing you can do, if I isolate this and I've got a polygon selection tool with this thing called the magic wand, which will select any polygons within a 45 degree angle of this, or rather it stops selecting when it gets past a 45 degree. So I can select here, make a cut, unwrap and hide it, click here, make a cut, unwrap. And so you can see how this could be a very, very quick process. Then I just switch over to the vertice selection, selecting those make a cut, unwrap, and that piece is done. Then we just need to do the pipe. So for this pipe, I'm just gonna select this end, make a cut, unwrap and hide that inner piece. And then same thing for this side. And then I'm going to make a seam underneath this. So select a point there, make sure I've got the same line underneath. Continuing that seam all the way up to here cut, unwrap, and then I'm going to select this island and make sure it's completely vertical like that. And now this whole piece is done. Okay, so here's an instance where I've got a bunch of similar meshes. And if I were to do this one at a time over and over again, uh, it would take forever. But there's a really cool feature here, and that's up here in the top right, which is clone selection across similar islands. So I've made a selection here of this part. And now if I click this button, now it's selected all of these. And so I can make the cuts and unwrap all of them really quickly. Awesome time saver. Okay, so I've now unwrapped everything. And <laughs> this is the mess that we get. All I have to do is hit P for pack and now it's organized them all in here. So now what I can do is say, for instance, I want this particular piece to be vertical. So what I can do is hit space bar and right mouse button, straighten this out. And then what I can do is hit this particular pack button, which only moves things, but doesn't rotate things. Let's do this one as well. If I want it to be perfect, what I can do is I can go into edge select and select these edges here, then go to Island Align and align that to be exactly horizontal. Then I can deselect everything and repack. If I look at the mesh, just taking a look at how the grid is moving across. Texel density is doing okay. Pretty solid, not too much stretching. And so that's our UVs. And so now whenever I texture this, I can move up and down. And if I want to do some straight lines or I want to look at one particular piece, I can select it 
and you can see that that's this piece and it would be it's much easier i can rotate the entire uv tile in substance painter and it would make it easier to paint things across it makes much more sense also these pieces look a lot more like their counterparts great so that's our uvs so i just hit Control s to save and that saves it to the obj it doesn't save it to a ryzen uv file or anything like that and once that's done we've got our uvs so to get the detail from our high poly model into our low poly, we're going to bake these mesh maps. And to do that, we're going to use Marmoset Toolbag. Now I have Marmoset Toolbag version 3. I think they just released version 4, which is really exciting. You can also use Substance Painter because it has built-in baking capabilities as well. And the same thing can apply, especially when it comes to the naming conventions that we're doing here. Now, the reason why I'm using Marmoset in this case is because it does a lot of these things in real time, giving me quick iteration and feedback because Marmoset is a real time render engine, very similar to how games work. And that's extremely useful because I'm using this as a VR weapon in Unreal Engine 4, which is a game engine. The important thing here is that Marmoset's gonna give me real-time feedback as I adjust really important properties for the baking. So we need a couple of maps to bake so that we can get some really good information that Substance Painter will be able to use. So we need to create a normal map, and the normal map is where we're going to have that high poly detail that transfers over to the low poly. We're also gonna be baking our ambient occlusion, which is the shadows that appear in the crevices where things seem to collide with each other or touch it's sort of like when you look into a corner of a room and you see that there are shadows in those crevices, that's going to be baked into a map. We're also going to bake a curvature map, and that's going to give Substance Painter the information it needs to create these really cool smart masks, good for edgeware. It just determines where there are crevices and corners in the mesh. And then we're going to bake either an object or a group ID map. And this is really cool because we can then use that map to select certain pieces of our mesh really quickly in Painter and either determine what its material is going to be or create a mask from that selection. It'll make sense later when we get into the texturing process. Now, the really cool thing here is the creation of baking groups. And that's why we put that underscore high, underscore low naming convention. All we have to do is hit the import button and Marmoset's going to automatically lay out all of these groups for us based on the high and low variations that we created in both of our models. It's also really useful because once we have those groups, it's gonna prevent me from getting a bunch of these artifacts. When you run through the baking process and you make it one cohesive mesh with no groups, you run into these weird errors and it'll look like certain things are inside other things. It's just, it looks kind of strange. So what people used to do is they used to expand and deconstruct their models so that they didn't have anything touching and it could quickly apply all of the calculations and math and rays and all that stuff that it does without any intersections or errors. This way, Marmoset is smart and knows that each of these pieces are separate and that it will only apply the baking to those pieces from the low and high poly variants. Very complicated stuff. Really the most important thing is if you create the groups, you won't have as many issues. So let's go ahead and do this. Okay, so you're probably expecting to see Marmoset Toolbag on the screen, but there's still one quick thing we need to do to this mesh, and that is triangulate the vertices. See, right now it's all quads, and while quads is really good for animation, triangles are much better for game engines. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna select everything here, Control A, and then I'm gonna use the Commander Shift C and type in triangulate, hit enter, and now it keeps the UVs, but what it does is just triangulate all of these quads. And so it's much easier for Marmoset, for Unreal Engine, to process this mesh now that it's a bunch of triangles. So let's export this out. I'm just gonna go to File, Export, OBJ. And so now let's go into Marmoset. Okay, now we're in Marmoset. And what I'm gonna do is drag in that triangulated low poly, drop it right in here, and here is our mesh. So I can just Alt left click to look around, rotate the camera. It's a bit bright. So what I can do is I can go to the sky and let's just lower the brightness. Just brought this in quickly to see what it looks like in this engine. And I can shift right click to rotate this HDRI light here. So it's looking pretty good, looking clean. No obvious normal artifacts or anything like that. So now let's bring this in for baking. So that was just a test. What I need to do now is just 
remove that by hitting delete. So here's where the cool part is. If I go to this icon here in the top left, which looks like some bread for baking, click on that. You see it brings up a baker here. What I can do is go to the quick loader, click load, and then I'm going to select my low poly triangulated version and my high poly and hit open. Now you have all these folders and you can see Marmoset has grouped the high poly component here with the low poly automatically. And this is incredible. So, so useful. So now what Marmoset does is it lets us preview what's going on as we do it. So I'm just gonna bring us to this front part of the mesh here, focusing on this front area here. What I'm gonna do is hit this P button. This creates a preview material. Now it's gonna say I don't have an output path for the baker to export these files to, so I'm gonna do that really quickly. And so it's gonna create this preview material and all of a sudden you can start to see some detail here. Now this is a preview bake, but you can right away see what it's doing. It's transferring some of that detail over. So let's adjust some of these settings. Right now I'm gonna take the samples, bring it up to 16, and I'm gonna hide our high poly mesh and just look at the low poly just to make sure we're not seeing things clip through. So I can click this, that'll toggle turning on the high and low poly. So now that one's off. So if I click on this component here and I'm gonna click on this low option here and what I can do now, you can see it has this cage around it and this is the baking cage and this is really cool. If you want to adjust this, if things are starting to intersect or you're not getting the desired result that you want, you can change the offset of this and this will automatically update as you do it. Really useful. So another thing to do, I'm gonna go back to my baker and I'm just gonna bring up the resolution from 2K to 4K and this will make things look a bit clearer, especially around here. Sometimes you find that things look like they're being projected on in the wrong direction. Now that might not be the case for this, but if you do have an issue like that, you can paint the skew. And so I can take this brush and you can see you've got these lines coming out from the normal. So you can paint over this and this is gonna align it to the right angle. And right away you could see we had a little bit of a change here and things start to orient correctly. And it looks like the 4K map just kicked in as well. And so this is good for things like screws. If you see they look kind of off or these small details, you can just paint the right skew direction. And this is great. You can see that you've got all of this information here. If I toggle this material on and off, let's say I take the, the default here and just click it, you can see that it disappears and I can just bring it back on and we've got our sculpted detail. Same thing with this section, really cool. Just adding on that extra detail. So when you fix the cages and the intersections and the offset, what you can do is configure which maps you'd like to bake. So I click on my baker here, go down to the maps. And so what I'm gonna do is do normals, curvature, ambient occlusion, and I'm gonna go to configure here. I'm gonna bring in an object ID and a group ID. Not sure which one I'm gonna use, but we can take a look at both of those. And you can see there's a bunch of maps that you can bake just from Marmoset like height position, thickness is a good one, bent normals. You can do lighting passes as well, transparency, specular. So I'm gonna hit done here, make sure I've got both of these selected and I know that I have an output. Oh, and I wanna go into my ambient occlusion here and click this cog wheel and I wanna bring up the ray count to 512 and click the add cavity option. The ray count is gonna make it so that the shadows themselves look a lot smoother and less noisy. Hit done, and now I'm gonna hit bake. Okay, so the baking's done. Now all I have to do is hit this preview material button. Boom, check that out. That ambient occlusion adds so much definition to this mesh. And you can see a lot of the things that we were dealing with with the pixelated map. It was just from the preview, it was a quick bake, but now you can see things are much cleaner. You can see you've got some nice detail on that front deflector piece that interacts with the light because it's a normal map. And we've got some really good edge wear detail here on the front. Yeah, things seem to bake pretty smoothly. And so it's easy to forget that this is a low poly mesh. What we could do is, I could just show you the wireframe here by going to render wireframe. You can see there's no geometry here. We can check out those rounded corners and see if that happens. So it looks like it did pretty well. Let me take off the wireframe. Yeah, so even though we've got flat edges here, you can see we've got some fake 
rounded corners that respond to the light just like they would if they were beveled. So that's really cool. I've got some nice pipe deformations. Awesome. All right, so we've covered quite a bit in this video. So we first started off by creating our low poly model and I was experimenting a little bit with how much density I wanted to add into the topology for each piece. Then once we had the low poly, we unwrapped the UVs using Ryzen UV. And that is quite a fun process though. It's something that you can really just kind of tune into some good music and kind of mindlessly go through and create this giant puzzle. After that, we brought everything into Marmoset and we baked all those mesh maps. We can get all that really nice detail from the sculpt pass and bake it right into that low poly model. So now we are finally ready for texturing. And this is the moment that I've been waiting for. I'm so excited to get going on this. So that'll be happening in the next video in this series. Also, speaking of more videos, there's quite a few coming. I've got a really fun tutorial coming up soon. Probably gonna be the next video after this. If you like this video and you like this series, hit the thumbs up. It lets me know that you're watching and that you'd like to see more videos like these. And if you want to see more videos, including some awesome tutorials for Substance Designer and other programs coming up very soon, hit subscribe and hit the bell to be notified when I post new videos. That's it for now. I'm Jeremy Siner and thanks for watching.